This is the final video on the 8 foot by 17 foot CNC router build in Wisconsin. This video will show some very basic procedures that I communicate to the client regarding calibration and the initial overview of a CNC router. But first, there are a few parts of the machine that I need to complete. There are two days remaining in this build, so I need to make sure all of the last minute items are complete, mainly the bed of the CNC router. I am applying the first layer of medium density overlay to the top of the bed frame. I am leaving the center open to gain access to the leg levelers below, at the midpoint of each rib. The sheets on the top serve as a structure to keep the table square. They will also be used as an underlayment for the spoil board. The client typically meets us in the morning for our daily progress report. We are actually discussing the gap that I'm preparing along the middle of the bed for access to the screws of the leg levelers. He has a concern that the gap may cause his HDPE sheets to sag. Under the high temperatures, he says that this is a possibility. This is the material that the client uses for his projects. It's a thin sheet of black HDPE, high density polyethylene. The material does not sit flat on the bed, so there were some issues to resolve considering there would be waves of material when the material was fastened to the spoil board. There is a machining operation parameter that is called clearance plane. This clearance plane is how far the spindle, or the z-axis, will raise during rapids to make sure it does not hit anything, like fixtures or uneven surfaces. A rapid is just the movement that the machine makes between actual milling or drilling operations. He decided that the gap was beneficial and to make sure the gap was maintained. This was a good thing because last winter he moved the machine to another location. Every location has a different floor surface unevenness and he did need to adjust these leg levelers. Another item that was discussed was the overhang of the bed material since the fourth rib was less than eight feet from the first rib. You can see this condition at the point where we're talking since we're standing next to that fourth rib and the eight foot of material is overhanging about one or two inches. This is not a problem since the spoil board on the top of these sheets will be glued to this layer of the boards. Additionally, the spoil boards will be glued in a staggered pattern. This creates a homogeneous top surface and will keep the machine square permanently. I am attaching the cable carrier and inserting the power cables and communication cable into the cable carrier. Only three cables need to fit into the cable carrier. The cable carrier is large enough to fit these cables easily, but due to the size of the machine, the cable carrier is undersized for the machine. We addressed and corrected this problem after the build. You might be curious why only three cables are being routed into the cable carrier. All of the electronics, with the exception of the computer, is mounted on the gantry. Even the water cooling is all compactly mounted on the z-axis. So power and communication is all that is needed through this cable carrier. The communication cable is just a USB cable, but because it's so long, it contains active repeaters along the cable at regular intervals. You can see my son Nicholas under the machine from time to time installing the leg levelers onto the bottom of each leg. The leg levelers along the sides are mainly to keep the gantry rails as straight as possible. I also want to make sure that the table is flat, first by adjusting the brackets until all of the ribs are level and show no torsion with respect to each other. In this case, I use my eye and look down the entire table and inspect the alignment of all the ribs to ensure that they are lined. A level is also used on a reference rib, so all of the ribs are also level with respect to the earth. Each rib top serves as a winding stick. Winding sticks are used to measure the flatness of a table top. Winding sticks are positioned at each end of the table and the eye is used to make sure the winding sticks are perfectly aligned. Nicholas is now adjusting the leg levelers on the far side, periodically making sure the rail is straight. He will take a look from the end of the rail, make an adjustment where he sees a bump or a crevice and adjust until those imperfections are removed. Nicholas is using a straight side of a board to determine if there is a sag or a bow on a rib. 
he will adjust the leg leveler until he is unable to see light between the board and the top of the rib. This will ensure flatness of the rib prior to laying down all of the board that will be set on top of the ribs. Now we make sure all of the screws and nuts are tight. Initially we only tighten a few of the screws on each bracket to allow movement while adjusting for level, straightness and flatness. With the frame securely tightened, it is time to lay on all of the sections of the table bed. This is the first layer of material that is being fastened to the machine. The medium density overlay boards on this layer are set in place, holes drilled through the board on each rib, and then fastened with a screw and nut. I am drilling the board through the ribs and Nicholas is coming back and adding the fasteners. I believe we were using quarter inch screws, countersunk, and quarter inch nuts on the bottom. This way, if the board needed to be removed at a later date, all they would have to do is remove the nuts on the bottom and lift up the boards. If the boards needed to be replaced for any reason, they can set the boards on top of the ribs, use the screw holes that are on the bottom where the ribs are, or they could have created new holes, and then fasten down the boards. I'm adding the spindle cooling equipment, which consists of a water reservoir, pump, and heat exchanger. This equipment is located compactly on the Z-axis, right next to the spindle, so tubing doesn't need to run through all of the cable carriers and throughout the machine. The only cable that is connected to this assembly is a 12-volt line that powers the pump and heat exchanger fan. This part of the assembly was not fastened to the Z-axis during the freight transport to keep it safe. This is the last day. The machine is completed with the exception of the top spoil board layer. The client arrives to get ready for the final instructions on how to use the machine. This client is completely new to CNC routers and this technology. So I will be introducing only a few of the features of the control of the machine at the start so I don't overwhelm the client. I help the client after the build from time to time when he needs guidance or gets stuck. Since the build has been complete, I have been working with the client by helping him produce CAM files and assisting him whenever he needs it. All right, so this is the Mach 3. This is the actual controller for the machine. It's mm -hmm. the control uh, user interface, mm -hmm. okay? And this is how you're gonna be using, uh, this is what you're gonna be using to control the machine. So you have various, um, features of this, of this particular screen. Uh, you have the location of where it thinks it is. Okay. And what, what I mean, when it, what it thinks it is, doesn't right. mean it really is that. Right. Until you actually Pro tell it where the zero, zero, zero yes, is. Yes, exactly. So, so um, for starting out, I see. Right. And this is the, the icon for it right here? Right, so let's go into it from ground mm, zero, zero here. Yeah. Okay. So Mach 3 loader. Yep. And the Mach 3 mil USB is the one you want to use. This is actually mm -hmm. a profile, so it has its own configuration settings and everything in it. You can make your own uh, profiles if you want. Okay, I got the nice chair and you got the horrible, yeah, the bad chair. But you got a rolling chair though, that's nice. Yeah. Um, so I'm starting with uh, the Mach 3. Yeah, these are actually physical files in the Mach folder. Okay. And they're XML files, which is just a sort of a, like a data file. Okay. We can delete all these other profiles, but I would keep them in there just yep. in case. And just press OK. Okay, yeah. And Mach 3 will start. You want to make sure that this is plugged in before yeah. you um, start this up. Okay. <coughs> so this is the reset. We're going to... I can keep the re reset on while I explain some of this so the machine doesn't do something okay. um, unpredictable. Okay. So this particular program, you can move the machine, you can start the spindle, you can do the various things. You can also run the G-code from this uh, program. So when you've created your CAM file, yep. that CAM file will go straight into this program. And then this program, you'll be able to run it. And it'll show the, the lines of code in this window, and it'll show what you'd expect to see once it's, it's done in this window. Okay. This is the screen that I usually use, is the, the program run screen. And you can use either that or the toolpath. I think the program run probably works better for like keyboard, um, keyboard input. The main uh, keys you're going to be using are the arrow keys and the page up, page down. Mm 
Yep. Page up, page down is up over here. This is going to uh, move your z-axis up and down. This is going to move your x-axis. So it, you can, uh, your, you can think page, about it like... What does your page use? The page down and page up yeah. are the z-axis going up and down. Oh, so page that's down... That's different than... I thought it right. was this before. Well, on my computer, my page up, page down is located here. Okay. I personally like to use the arrow keys. There's also, if you press tab, you'll see an MPG here, which is manual pulse generator. It's not really a manual pulse generator. It's just a, uh, a pretty picture of one. And you can click using your mouse oh, to I, make the X and Y. That's an alternative like way, that. right? Right. So I you like can press that. tab to get to that. OK, so let's, uh, let's calibrate the machine. Let's do that first. OK. So I'm going to go to the settings. Yep. And uh, I'm going to use the steps pre unit. But first, I want to position the machine in a, in, in a place where we can start the calibration. Mm -hmm. And the longer length uh, distance to calibrate, the more accurate the machine is going to be. OK. OK. Yeah. So like sure. calibrating for one inch, right. uh, you may be off on like yeah. 17 feet by sure. quite a lot. But if you calibrate at like, say, 10 feet, uh, the 17 feet uh, error will be very, very small. And then we can, we can try first doing like maybe two or three feet, uh -huh. just to make sure that the, the thing won't run off the table or right. you know, unpredictably. Yeah. So once we get like two or three feet right, then we can calibrate for like 17 feet okay. or 16 feet. Uh, so we'll start, let's say, around here, somewhere where we are. Okay. And Thank you. actually, you know what? I'll start where maybe we can see it on the video. You right. Okay. All right, so I'm going to set this as my x0, OK? Oh. Now, when I move the x, you'll start to see this number move. I'm in the negative region, 12 inches. And I'm sure it's not 12 inches, because that's def definitely didn't look like you it was 12 inches. You were moving it to the left, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And on to the right will be the positive region. Right. Yeah. So that thinks it's 12 inches. It might be 12 inches. I don't know. We'll How see. did you set that? You, you, I just you, pressed, uh, yeah, that's a good you, question. You. I pressed 0x. OK, and so, that, and, and so it recorded this as? Like, mm -hmm. that, uh, this that's, is the, that's where it thinks the zero position okay. is. So or, later on, when we get going, we'll put it down where we want it. And, and then, then you'll press 0x, zero 0y, zero zero and 0z. Mm -hmm. And once I have the limit switches set, yeah. you, might, you, you, you can just press ref all home, and it'll automatically go to a position that you'd expect to be zero. Oh, OK. Or you can just do it manually. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I, I always do it manually, because I'm always going in a different place in the, on the table. Oh, for, for, a, for yeah. an origin. Or right, right. I so you can, you can make your origin anywhere on the table yeah. you want. I keep my origin in one place. Yeah. Well, that, you might want to use the ref all home then. OK, we got to keep it simple for J. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to put 0 on all of them just, to, sure. just for simplicity. Yeah. All right, so this is zero, and let's go to the, diagno uh, the settings tab, yeah. and we're going to set uh, steps per unit. Okay. All right, so we're going to do the x-axis. It's all, you know, it's like a wizard. It kind of guides you as, it, as you go along. I'm going to press OK. This is the axis we want to, to calibrate. Yep. And then how far would you like the x-axis to move? So I believe this is in inches, so let's, mm -hmm. uh, let's just say 30 inches, just to be on the safe side. Okay. We, we don't want to go too far. And when we press OK, it's going to move. The camera lost battery and missed most of the X calibration. But we redid the calibration, so here it is. Um, let's go ahead and do a calibration of the, uh, the X because we lost that calibration. So I'm going to mm -hmm. go to settings, um, set steps per unit, X axis. Let's go ahead and do uh, 8 feet. Now let's, go, let's do uh, 10 feet, 120. Let's move the, um, move the tape right here so we can measure it. OK. All right, so we're going to press OK with 120. It's going to move 120 inches. I usually use a magnet on the rail against the back of the bearing block instead of tape. That looks like 10 feet. All right, so we are 1 16th off. 10.0625. That's how far it moved. 10.0625. 10 feet. Oh, we have to do this again. I did 10 inches. Oh, that was so stupid. See, it says 17,000. It should be 41484, four, something like that. Let's do it again. Shit. Settings. 
steps per unit. We're going to do the x-axis. Let's do this again. 120 because I screwed up. Press OK. It's going to move 120 inches. Okay, we are at 124 and 1 16th. 124.0625. All right. Press yes. 1435. Press OK. All right, so we're good. So do we want to recalibrate? Let's, um, let's send him, uh, let's do the homing egg one more time. And I really don't think we need to recalibrate because that was a pretty good calibration right there. Well, you should, you, should, um, you should do more than one calibration just to confirm. All right, so let's uh, rough all the home. Let's make sure they're at home. We took a break on the client briefing to finish up on the spoil board application. I'm gluing the next spoil board layer to the initial layer that I fastened to the ribs. This is something that I do with my own machine. From time to time, the spoil board is resurfaced with a surfacing tool. And if the resurfacing reaches near the lamination, which is where it's glued to the next board, Another spoil board can be glued down. When the resurfacing does come close to the glued lamination, a new set of spoil boards can then be glued down, as long as there is enough clamping and weights on the spoil board. Since it is laying on a resurfaced surface, the new boards may not need to be resurfaced. In the case of this client, the client will be using the same origin and his designs don't vary too much, so the spoil board may never need to be resurfaced. I am moving the gantry close to the origin so I can instruct the client how to home the machine. All right, so we're gonna um, make this thing go home, to the home, um, home area. Okay. So I press ref all home, and it will automatically go to its parking position. Um, ref all home. I lost the footage of this homing process, but I do it later anyway. Okay, so let's uh, zero the Z now. The Z axis is zeroed manually. This is somewhat difficult since the computer was so far away from the Z axis. A hand wheel, pendant, or a touch plate would have come in handy. With such an uneven surface, it is best to zero on the top of the spoil board and provide an offset to serve as the top of the wavy HDPE using the thickness of that material. I'm gonna click on zero Z. Yep. Now it knows that's a zero, so we can go page up um, and now it, we, we don't have to touch that anymore. Right. It already knows that's a zero. Okay, Okay. so now yeah. let's calibrate the Y axis because we haven't done that yet. Oh. So let's go to um, the settings and we're going to set steps per unit and we're going to go to the y-axis and let's say how, how far would we like to go let's mark with a tape okay, i'm going to put the first tape where the um right where the bearing is located perfectly and then i'm going to have it move um we have eight feet to go, but i don't want to go down all that way because we've never calibrated it yet so let's let's go let's do 10 inches first just to make sure 11, okay, 11 and um, 360, uh, wait, 2, 4, 5, 30 seconds. 11.15625, okay. Yeah, it's set at 14.34, which is very similar to the x-axis. So they're all set the same. Okay. The y-axis has been set. All right, now let's do it again. So we can, um, let's go back to zero. Here is another example of homing in the machine. You'll notice that it moves relatively quickly to the limit switch, pulls off the limit switch, and then moves very slowly to the limit switch to get a more accurate origin. I have the setting for the second move really slow, probably a lot slower than it needs to be. I'm homing the X and Y axes so I can recalibrate the Y axis, but at a much longer distance. You want to calibrate at the longest and safest dimension possible so that the calibration is more accurate. The accuracy at any dimension under the 8 feet should be good. I use the tape on this calibration 
but I typically use a magnet on the rail or I make a small scratch with the end mill on the surface of the spool board to make the initial position. No, we never did the y-axis uh, calibration. We only did the x-axis. You can see that it's now doing the x-axis. Those two same movements. And now you can see it's going really slowly towards the back of the machine to make sure the x-axis has a good registration for the origin. All right, so now x and y is at zero. I'm going to put z at zero. Oh, no. Z is, that's correct for z. I'm not going to change z. All right, now let's do another calibration, and we'll go a little farther. We'll go um, six feet. I think that's probably safe. Or 72 inches. So let's go 72 inches. Press OK. We're really close. We're at 72 and 3 sixteenths. 72.1875. Okay, now it's changed it to from 13, uh, 1434 to 1430. So it changed about four steps per inch. And we're done. Let's do the okay. Z axis to make sure the Z axis is done correctly. Go ahead. One more. One more. And it's touching. I'm going to go to the Z axis, press OK. And it should hopefully it'll go into the positive region. So I'm going to go uh, two inches. Press OK. I'm going to put my finger on the tilde just to make sure. OK, let's see if that's two inches. Yeah, we are at two inches. So 1600 steps is correct. And that's because it's, uh, it's a lead screw that is uh, two turns per inch. And um, it's set at, uh, the motor is set at 200 uh, steps per revolution. And it's set at quarter. So that, that would be 800. And that's uh, 800 times two is 1600. So that makes sense. Okay. All right, so the, um, the cross here is show where the actual machine is located. So when I move the machine, you can show it there. All right, I Bring it up to Y. And I'll move the X axis. And you can see how the crosshairs move across. So we can also use this as a way to determine how big the thing is going to be. Uh -huh. And we can verify that that's correct. You have to ma manually stop it at the right time? No, no, you don't have to. I'm just using yeah, it to, yeah. to, to measure, to determine. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, let's, let's make the, uh, the y-axis go to the very top to make yeah. sure that we're still on the material. Right. All right, that's, the, that's where the topmost part is going to be. So it looks like it's still good. What I did there was I used the view in Mach 3 and moved the axes to make sure all the operations are within the expected bounds of the machine. Here I am demonstrating the go to zero button to get all the axes to the origin. This doesn't rehome like ref all axes. It simply goes to the location that you set as zero zero zero. All right, so to make this start and do its job, all you're going to do is press the cycle start. This green button here. Okay. All right. And this is all you'll need to do. You're going to load the file and you're going to press cycle start. Make sure it's home and that's it. So let's go ahead and press it and see what happens. And cross your fingers. All right, it raised the z-axis. Do we have to plug in the uh, anything? No. We're just doing an error. Oh, error yeah. wrong. Okay, to make sure that the machine is calibrated and is moving expectedly, we are starting the machining and allowing it to perform all the machining operations in this run but without actually touching the table. The machine is essentially just milling in the air. While this is going on, I explain the few ways to stop the machine if necessary. Alright, so if you want to stop it, you have two different types of stop. You have a feed hold 
and you have a stop. The feet hold will um, stop the machine from moving, but it'll maintain its position so you can continue later on. Oh. So if you like, want to go to get lunch, use uh -huh. the feet hold. But the stop is almost like a reset. Okay. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna do a feet hold, and you can see that it waits until the the current action is complete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just holds everything right in right. place. If you do a stop, it'll it'll just stop it. All right, so I'm going to uh, do an air run of um, something that has profile machining operation in it. So I'm going to go ahead and press the cycle start. Everything is good over there. I still have quite a bit of Z. And when you see the Z go down, that's right. I am demonstrating another air run. The prior run was just drilling operations. This run is profiles, where the milling occurs along a path, generally cutting horizontally. Next, I will introduce the feed override to the client. If you want to increase the feed rate, you can actually override it and go faster here. You can see it says 80 inches per minute. And if you want to go faster, you can press the plus and make it go faster. So now you're going at actually 135. Demonstrating the feed override during an operation in the air is safe to do since it is not cutting and gives the client a good understanding of the concept since he is able to see the movement of the machine in action. Now we are finally doing some real cutting to test the machine. The first set of operations are drills. There are quite a number of drills and this is the main reason he purchased the machine in the first place. The client used to do all of these drills by hand and would drill many thousands of holes per day. During this operation we're verifying that the holes are in the right place, um, the holes are being uh, positioned in the locations that he would expect. We actually ended up doing a number of these sheets with all of the drills and profiles for cutting out the shapes he needed. We discussed various tooling options and we also did some sheets where we stacked the sheets to improve the efficiency of the process. Thank you for watching this series. Please leave a comment below and consider following me on Instagram, subscribing to my YouTube channel and clicking the like button. You can find a link to my Instagram below in the description.